Hi everyone, it's Mr. H here and welcome to this video on 1.3 parent functions. Today's lesson we're going to be looking at five parent functions, functions that we're going to be using throughout the rest of this course and we're going to be shifting and translating these and stretching and compressing them in such a way that we're going to be able to change a whole bunch of features of these graphs. But we're always going to start at the basis or the foundation of each of these five parent functions. Now two of them we're already very familiar with. The first one we're going to look at is a linear function. And so you might have seen that written in the past as y equals x, but now in function notation we could write that as f of x equals x, where f of x is on the y-axis and x is on the x-axis. Now we know that um, there's nothing special here. Whatever x is is what y is. So uh, we can go ahead and put those values in, and we know that if x is 5, y is 5, if x is 3, y is 3, etc. And we then can plot those points. And we're just assuming every point, uh, every grid is one here. So this is two, four, and uh, you get the picture of the scale here. So I'm going to plot, uh, I could plot those points. You, you don't even need to plot all these points to see what it looks like because you know what this is going to look like. It's going to look something like this. And so zero, zero, negative one, negative one, negative three, negative three, and negative five, negative five. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put a line through those points and that represents the line y equals x or f of x equals x. So what I want you to do right now with that in mind is I want you to go ahead and fill in the properties and the domain and range of this function. And then I'm going to graph each one of these with you and then allow you some time after that to fill in the properties, domain and range. So the next function we're going to look at is the quadratic function. And the quadratic function we know is in the past, we've seen it as y equals x squared. Now we see it as fx equals x squared. And so we're just going to take that function and we're going to graph it, the, the parent function. We've seen this before. And we know that if x is 3, then 3 squared gives you 9. If x is 2, then 2 squared gives you 4. 1 squared gives you 1. 0 squared gives you 0. Negative 1, this would be like in brackets, it would be like negative 1 squared, which always gives you a positive because negative 1 times negative 1 is positive. So in that case, we would get positive 1, negative 2 squared would be positive 4, negative 3 squared is 9. This is nothing new to us. We've graphed this several times before. But here you go. And then 3 and 9 is right there. And then we have symmetry about the y-axis of this parent function. And it's going to look something like that. And then what we do is we join all the dots up from those key points that we've graphed. And that's the line f of x equals x. And again, this is f of x on the y-axis. So those are the first two. And again, just like we did before, we're going to go and we're going to list the properties, domain, and range, which I'll take up later in the video. Now we come to what's called a square root function. And the function that's a square root function is this. f of x equals the square root of x. And so let's just graph it, because if you don't know what a graph looks like, we always start from a table of values. Once we understand what it looks like, we should just be able to graph it and go from there. But at this starting point, we're going to use a table of values. So here we have uh, 0 is the x value. If I put the square root of 0, that's going to give me 0. Now I have 1 is the x value. If I put the square root of 1, that gives me 1. You'll notice the next value isn't 2, because the square root of 2 isn't a whole number. But we've used the next perfect square, because the square root of 4 is 2. And then we use the next perfect square after that. The square root of 9 is 3. So we go to our grid, and we're going to say 0 is 0, 1 is 1, but then 4 and 2, and 9 and 3. So what we're going to get is something that looks like this. And if you think that looks like the top half of a sideways parabola, you would be correct. This is f of x, because... It, that's the positive part, but if we took the negative root, it would be looking something like this down here. All right, the next one is the reciprocal function. A reciprocal function is graphing f of x equals 1 over x. And so I invite you here to pause the video and think this out yourself once I show you the first one. You're going to, in this case, go 1 for f of x. It's going to be 1 over 4, well, 0.25 or a quarter. Uh, for f of x, when it's x is 2, it's going to be 1 over 2, or a half. 
When it's one, it's just going to be one. But what happens when it's zero? One divided by zero is undefined. We cannot divide by zero. Well, something interesting happens there. Let's go now to the negative values. When it's 1 over negative 1, that's going to give me negative 1. When it's 1 over negative 2, that gives me negative 1 over 2, or negative 0.5. And then when it's negative 4, that's going to give me negative 1 over 4, or negative 0.25. Okay, well, that's all well and interesting, but what's happening in here, in this step right here? Well, here I want you to just to look at a couple other numbers just so we can see a pattern that's forming. The first thing I want you to look at is 0.5. What happens when x is 0.5? Well, if x is 0.5, then 1 divided by 0.5 is 2. And likewise, what happens when x is 0.25? 1 divided by 0.25 gives you x is 4. So let's just deal with the positive part for a minute. We know that we have 4 and a quarter. So four and a quarter, that's somewhere like down here. We have two and one half, that's somewhere right about there. Oops. We have one and one. And then we also found a half. So when it's a half, it's two. And when it's a quarter, it's four. Well, what's happening here? Well, what's actually what it's actually doing, because it can never get to zero is it's forming what we've seen before, very briefly, but we have seen this before, it's forming an asymptote. It's going to get closer and closer and closer to the y-axis, but it's never going to reach it. Likewise, with the x-axis, it's going to get closer and closer to the x-axis, but it's never going to reach it. And if we plot the same things for the negative values, negative 4 was negative a quarter, right there. Negative 2 is negative a half. Negative 1 was negative 1. And if we go and we also checked out negative 0.5 and negative 0.25, we'd found those, find those values to be negative 2 and negative 4. Just think about it for a minute. If you need to pause the video, don't just take my word for it. Think about it logically so that you can actually figure this out on your own. If I put in negative 0.5, 1 divided by negative 0.5, 1 divided by a half is 2, and it's negative. And then 1 divided by negative 0.25, 1 divided by 0.25 is 4, and it's negative. So we have that point right there, and that point right there. What you're seeing is you're seeing that this asymptote um, also comes into play on this part of it. So this only exists in what we call the first quadrant and the third quadrant. This is quadrant 2, this is quadrant 4. More on that when we look at the properties later, but it only exists in the first and third quadrant with these asymptotes. That for most people is the most complicated of the parent functions because uh, clearly it's got these asymptotes, it's got these curves, and uh, we have to be very careful with the points. This next one sounds a little intimidating at first to some people, but it's not actually that intimidating. Um, maybe just to look at it in terms of uh, y and x before we introduce the f of x. Um, it's written like that, and so if we if we're talking about it being a function, then we could technically write it out like that. All it means is whatever the x value is, we're going to make it positive. If it's positive, it stays positive. If the x value is negative, it's going to make the y value positive. That's all the absolute value means. We're going to take the, the value minus the negative sign if there is one. That's it. So if x is 5, f of x is 5. If x is 3, f of x is 3. If x is 1, f of x is 1. If it's 0, it's 0. But here's where the absolute value comes into play. If it's negative 1, we strip away the negative, make it 1. If it's negative 3, we strip away the negative, make it 3. If it's negative 5, we strip away the negative, make it 5. And so we plot those points like this. And we get these points as shown. If you need to pause the video again, make sure you get it. That's great. So what we're going to get here is we're going to get something that goes up there. And then at 0, kind of changes course and goes up in this direction instead. And so this is the graph of f of x equals the absolute value of x. The graph that we had above is the graph of f of x equals 
1 over x. It's, it's all of this. It's not just this top corner piece. It's also the bottom corner piece. That represents the whole function. And then the one that we had above, as we already said, that was the square root of x. So here's what I want you to do. Based on the information of those graphs, I want you to go ahead, start listing the properties of each of these graphs. So those properties include the following. They include um, the direction it opens in, if it opens a certain direction. They include what quadrants they're in. Remember, this is quadrant one up here. This is quadrant two. This is quadrant three. And this is quadrant four. Uh, they also include things like the asymptotes, if there are asymptotes. Um, maybe a line of symmetry, if there's lines of symmetry. And then, based on what we've done previously in our course for domain and range, see if you can write the domain and range for each of these parent functions. And then when you're done that, play the video uh, some more, and you can watch as I just explain the answers. So in this first case, what we have is the linear relationship. We know all about linear relations. Again, quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. And so the properties here is that it exists in um, quadrant one and four. That would be the first thing, the quadrants it exists in. And obviously, if we shift it up and, or down a little bit, it's going to exist also in a third quadrant. Uh, it's a straight line that passes through the origin. All right, what else? Well, we know the slope. We know the slope of this is equal to 1. And that's really all we can say about this. You could say as it's going up to the right, as the x increases, the y increases, as the x decreases, the y decreases. You could note that as well. The domain here is that x is a set of all real numbers. And assuming it goes on and on forever to the right and forever and ever to the left, it's not going to have any limits. The range, the same thing f of x is a set of all real numbers with no limits on that. Clearly, if it was a real world situation, it would probably have a limit. But if we're just graphing that function, there are technically no limits on the function. On y equals x squared, again, we're very familiar with this. But now we have this idea of it existing in these quadrants. So it exists in quadrants 1 and 2. We also know that it opens up. We can also write that the vertex is the origin. The y-axis is the axis of symmetry, because it's the same on both sides of that. And the x-intercept, the only one there is, there's only one, is at the origin. So basically the idea, if you're not catching on to this yet, is we're always just trying to write as many different properties that we can about the graph that we're looking at. Not about what it would look like when it's transformed, but just about the parent function itself. So in this case, the domain is, again, x is a set of all real numbers. And the range is f of x is a set of all real numbers, but it has a restriction in this case. So that funny looking e, all real numbers, such that f of x is greater than or equal to zero. So it has a restriction on the range in this case. So if you haven't paused the video and you're just following along and writing this in as I go, now you need to pause it and you need to actually try to come up with some of these properties by yourself for the next three. So for this next one, the square root function, what we have for the first property is that it opens to the right. You might have said this in different orders, that's fine, but hopefully you got this considered. Uh, the vertex, because it is a sideways parabola, is at the origin. It's only in quadrant one. And there are minimums to both x and y, which is interesting. Normally, just one variable has a minimum with the parabola. But in this case, because it's, um, it stops at the vertex, there's minimums from both the x and y. The x-intercept is at the origin. Would be another property we could list. So what's the domain and range? Well, the domain 
is x is a set of all real numbers such that x is bigger than or equal to 0. And the range follows suit. Set of all real numbers such that um, f of x is bigger than or equal to 0. Now, it's not going to go up as fast as the x values are, but it's still eventually going to reach an infinite number if you have a big enough of an x value. For the reciprocal function, this is what we call a hyperbola. Not hyperbole, it's a hyperbola. It has no intercepts. We also can see that they have two asymptotes. And we'll work those asymptotes into the domain and range in a minute. You can also note that if you draw the line y equals x, right along there, and you draw the line y equals negative x, so this is the line y equals negative y equals negative x, and this is the line y equals x, either one of those lines is this graph is symmetrical over. Right? You could literally mirror it over that line, either one of them. So those two lines are lines of symmetry. Interesting. And then we can also say it exists in quadrants 1 and 3, as I've already noted. So what's the domain? Well, the domain is x is a set of all real numbers. And it looks as if it's going to go on forever in the, x, in the positive x and forever in the negative x direction. But don't forget there's this asymptote right in the middle. So x cannot be 0. That's how we'd write the domain. It can be anything except 0. And likewise, you can see that there's a restriction on the domain, or on the range, rather. I'm sorry. f of x is a set of all real numbers such that f of x, you can see here, cannot be equal to 0. Right? It's not able to be equal to 0 anywhere along there. That's always going to approach that line but never hit it. And last but not least, we have the absolute value. And so this exists, uh, we could say, in quadrant 1 and 3. 1 and 2, I'm sorry. Quadrants 1 and 2. We know we could say it opens up. It's not a parabola, but it kind of has this, one of those properties, kind of like a parabola. We could say that the vertex is at the origin. So the maximum value of a, of a function or the minimum value of a function is always referred to as a vertex. And the x and y intercepts are both also at the origin. So what are the domain and range? Well, the domain is going to have no restriction. x is a set of all real numbers. But the range, just like our parabola, is going to have a restriction. f of x is a set of all real numbers such that f of x is greater than or equal to 0. It's going to come down to zero, but it's never going to get below that on the parent function. So what you should do right now, just to make sure you know this and have a good understanding of it, there's no real homework on this topic beyond just saying, can you draw these functions really efficiently and really quickly? And do you know the, some of these properties of them? So it would be a good idea right now to go back and try to redraw these functions without having the table of values or the pictures in front of you to make sure that you can draw these on command um, without taking the time to develop a table of values again. So there you go. Hope that's helpful. And uh, we're going to be doing a lot with this. Like I said, it's important we have this down. You should know it as well as you know um, some things you know the best because everything builds off this. And if we don't have this foundation, the tower is going to crumble. So good luck as you work on that. And as always, reach out if you have any questions.